The Corbett Report is brought to you by you. Your support makes The Corbett Report possible. Sign up for the subscriber newsletter or purchase a DVD at corbettreport.com slash support. I'm not holding my breath, let's put it that way, but you never know. And sometimes these people do get scapegoated and sometimes there are different factions and when they fight, the, you know, the, the knives might come out and who knows, but there is some interesting things may be revealed. That's why we have to watch very carefully the development of the story and we'll see if Epstein commits suicide in jail or whatever it is. I mean, who knows? Some breaking news right now. Disgraced financier Jeffrey Epstein has taken his own life while he was behind bars here in New York City. Epstein was facing sex trafficking charges. NBC News investigative correspondent Tom Winter now has the very latest. Tom, what more do we know? What more do we know? That is the question for today. Welcome to the Corbett Report podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. I am your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, coming to you on this 14th day of August, 2019, with episode 361 of the Corbett Report podcast, Suicided, the final days of Jeffrey Epstein. And what we have just been listening to and witnessing is, of course, the stunning prediction that I made myself about Jeffrey Epstein, that he would be found suicided in his jail cell. Wow, how could I have ever predicted such a thing? Well, of course, of course, if you are watching The Corporate Report, you no doubt know that not only myself, but many, many, many other people in the conspiracy theory community have been talking about the very likely possibility that Jeffrey Epstein would end up dead in jail. And lo and behold, Jeffrey Epstein has ended up dead in jail. Or has he? Dot, dot, dot. So, this is obviously going to be an exploration of the questions about what we know and what we don't know about the death or presumed death of Jeffrey Epstein by apparent suicide, as it is being reported. And there are a few caveats and things to get out of the way before we begin this exploration. First and foremost, I want to put a special thank you to each and every member of the CorporateReport.com community who contributed to my recent request for an open source investigation into this incident. Uh, boy, have you responded. At the time that I am recording this podcast episode, which for the record is about 9.30 a.m. Japanese time on the 14th of August, 2019, there are over 225 comments now in that open source investigation. Literally hundreds of links and analysis and all sorts of things relating to Epstein and his death. So, Honestly, my heartfelt thanks to everyone in that Corbett Report community who not only makes this website literally possible with your support, as little as $1 a month, but who also helps to collate, collect, analyze, and keep for posterity these various different pieces of the Epstein puzzle. It is extremely important, and your participation in that thread has been greatly valuable and greatly appreciated. It is an honor and a privilege to be doing this work for the members of the Corporate Report community and with the members of the Corporate Report community. It is uh, it is something to behold. So thank you very much for that participation. Secondly, although the title of this podcast episode does contain the word suicided, I want to stress, not that it needs to be stressed, but just for the record, I want to stress this is, of course, not an episode of the Requiem for the Suicided series, which tends to be a lionization of the subject of each episode of that series. If you're not familiar with it, please go to my Requiem for the Suicided series, where we've talked about people who have blown the whistle or uh, threatened to leak important information in the past and have found themselves dying of suicide, in quotation marks, um, although there is generally reason in the cases that I have highlighted to believe that it was not suicide. It was, in fact, murder, hence the term suicided. But as I say, those Requiem for the Suicided episodes tend to be a lionization of the person who was trying to convey important information to the public. Obviously, that is not the case in today's episode. There is no lionization of Jeffrey Epstein intended or implied, as you all know. But again, I just want that to be absolutely clear. This is an autopsy, if you will forgive the, the pun or the, the, uh, the metaphor at any rate, of 
the death of Jeffrey Epstein, of the events surrounding that death. That is what is it about what it is about. It is not obviously intended to say that Jeffrey Epstein was some great whistleblower who was going to bring the whole house down and needs to be lionized or venerated in any way for his participation in the despicable acts that he has been associated with. Now thirdly, to stress this podcast episode is specifically an exploration of Jeffrey Epstein's death. As I stated specifically in my video the other day asking for help with this investigation, this is specifically about Epstein's death. It's not about the bigger Epstein picture and who all his associations and what intelligence op was being run and all of that. That's a much bigger story and one that I know a lot of people are digging up important information about. Once again, if you have not looked through those 225 plus comments in that open source investigation on CorbettReport.com, I suggest you do so because there is a lot of information, a lot of links to very valuable information surrounding this case. That might be a good starting point. The next place you would want to go is to episode 304 of the Corbett Report podcast, Political Pedophilia, where I did talk about the Epstein case at that time, back in, I believe, 2015, so four years ago. And if you type Epstein into the search bar of CorbettReport.com, you will see the many, many different videos and interviews and podcasts that I have done on this subject over the past several years. Um, so that would be a good starting point for an exploration of the bigger picture of Epstein. There is much more to say about that as information continues to come out. Um, I would also direct you to places like the ConsciousResistance.com, where obviously Derek Bros, previous CorbettReport.com guest, has been doing good work on the Epstein case for years. And uh, more recently to the InfoWarrior YouTube channel of Jason Burmis, where he has been really doing document deep dives and, and uh, thorough analysis on a daily basis, several videos a day about this case. So uh, definitely worth checking out those sources. And there are many, many more sources, as I say, in that open source investigation. If you need to get up to speed on Epstein, the bigger case. But as I say, this is specifically about Jeffrey Epstein's final days, his death, or whatever happened there at the Metropolitan Correction Center in Lower Manhattan, and what we know and what we don't know and what we know that we don't know and what we don't know that we don't know and all of that. Um, now, the final caveat to this exploration is this is, of course, by necessity, incomplete and tenuous. This is obviously a breaking and developing story, but whenever you cover breaking news stories, you have to find that line where, okay, we have to present something, even though obviously this is not the full story and there will be more information coming out. So obviously, again, the big shining caveat here, this is being recorded 9.30 a.m. Japanese time on August 14th, 2019. I've done my level best to be as up to date on this story at this moment in time as I can be. But there will obviously be de developments and new information coming out, even probably between the time I record this and the time that you're listening to it, let alone days, weeks, months, or years down the road. So obviously this is just a sna snapshot, but it is a snapshot of what we know at this moment. So let's set the table for this exploration by just starting with the timeline of the recent events and developments in the Jeffrey Epstein case starting on July 6th of this year, which was the date that Epstein was arrested at Teterboro, Teterboro Airport in New Jersey, New Jersey, on his way back from Paris in his private jet. He was arrested at the airport. On July 10th, it was confirmed that he had been booked in as inmate 76318-054, at the Metropolitan Correction Center in Lower Manhattan that houses a number of prominent uh, inmates, shall we say, and has an interesting history, and there's different things related to that that we will explore in this investigation. But on July 10th, it was confirmed that he was being held there. On July 23rd, there was the first, quote-unquote, suicide attempt. It was portrayed as a apparent suicide attempt at the time. Details, of course, are sketchy, and there have been indications and intimations by uh, uh, sources that know Epstein that say that he had told authorities that he had been violently attacked or threatened, uh, that his life was in danger. Those are the stories that surrounded that July 23rd first suicide attempt, which did involve Epstein being taken to medical custody, and receiving some form of treatment and being put on a suicide watch. But we now learn, after his death, that in late July, and that is, uh, that's the, the, the time frame that I've 
I've been able to hammer it down to in the reporting that I've seen. I haven't seen a specific date for this yet, but in quote unquote late July, so somewhere within a week after that first quote unquote suicide attempt, Epstein was taken off suicide watch at his lawyer's request, is what we're being told right now. And that suicide watch was downgraded to a special observation status, which specifically required a physical check of Epstein, or at least a visual check, I should say, of Epstein every 30 minutes. Something that did not take place, as we'll get into later. On August 9th, there was a uh, new tranche of thousands of pages of documents released, uh, which included... Uh, related to Epstein and, and Maxwell and some of these other characters in the court cases of various individuals. And these documents did implicate or at least allege that uh, Maine Senator George M Mitchell and ex-New Mexico Governor, Governor Bill Richardson and Prince Andrew, as we already know, and several others were involved in sexual abuse of underage girls along with Epstein. Uh, and it was also on August 9th that his cellmate, Epstein's cellmate, at that lower uh, Manhattan Metropolitan Correction Center was removed, and Epstein was not being monitored as required. Again, this has come out in the days since whatever happened on August 10th, that on August 9th, his cellmate was removed, and he was not being checked. On August 10th, of course, as you know by now, he was, Jeffrey Epstein was, quote-unquote, found dead, quote-unquote, by a bedsheet hanging, is the word that we are receiving now. Again, all of, or very much of this information comes from various sources that are talking to various outlets, like the New York Post. So, let's sort through what we actually know and what we don't know, and why... A bedsheet hanging does not seem particularly plausible. In fact, that was addressed quite directly in one of the earliest um, pieces about the Epstein case and, and uh, the whatever happened there on August 10th, which was posted the evening of August 10th on NewYorkPost.NYPost.com. Former MCC inmate, there's no way... Jeffrey Epstein killed himself. And this article says that the following account is from a former inmate of the Metropolitan Correction Center in Lower Manhattan, where Jeffrey Epstein was found unresponsive Saturday and declared dead at a hospital of an apparent suicide. The ex-convict, who spoke to the Post's Brad Hamilton and Bruce Golding on the condition of anonymity, spent several months in the Nine South Special Housing Unit for high-profile prisoners awaiting trial like Epstein. Uh, this goes on to say, there's no way that man could have killed himself. I've done too much time in those units. It's an impossibility. Between the floor and the ceiling is like eight or nine feet. There's no way for you to connect to anything. You have sheets, but they're paper level, not strong enough. He was 200 pounds. It would never happen. When you're on suicide watch, they put you in this white smock, a straitjacket. They know a person cannot be injurious to themselves. The clothing they give you is a jump-in uniform. Everything is a dark brown color. Could he have done it from the bed? No, sir. There's a steel frame, but you can't move it. There's no light fixture. There's no bars. The account goes on from there. You do notice that he does make the stipulation when you're on suicide watch, which, as I alluded to before and as we will get into later, was not the case, but other physical details of the cell that Epstein was confined to uh, presumably are the same um, and include presumably the fact that the sheets are paper level, not strong enough to support a 200 pound man hanging himself. 200 pounds? Do we have that confirmed? At any rate, uh, a fully grown adult male uh, would probably not be able to hang himself on paper level sheets, but we are being told at this point it was a bed sheet hanging that did the trick. Interesting. So what... This does raise the question. Well, if, okay, so he... If he was on suicide watch, there would be a white smock, but he wasn't on suicide So what was he wearing? And what did he have access to? Where, where, what happened? So let's boil it down. What do we actually know? And what do we know that we don't know about what took place in that cell on August 9th and 10th? Well, first of all, we have evidence of some sort that was, again, presented at the NY Post within an hour or two of the uh, the death being reported. 
Um, and this is not any particular endorsement of the New York Post. It's just that as a New York paper that's been covering this closely, it has been the source of a lot of information that's come out, including photos show Jeffrey Epstein as he's wheeled into downtown hospital. And uh, this story starts by noting paramedics frantically tried to revive convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein early Saturday morning after he was found unresponsive in his cell in downtown Manhattan. Exclusive photos shot by the Post reveal. The 66-year-old disgraced financier hanged himself in his cell, blah, blah, blah. Call was placed to first responders around 6.30 a.m., as MCC staff tried to revive him, said the FDNY and the Bureau of Prisons. Photos of Epstein taken around 7.30 a.m. show the convicted pedophile still wearing his orange prison jumpsuit as he's wheeled on a gurney into New York Presbyterian Lower Manhattan Hospital. The images show a drawn, ashen face to close eyes and EMTs using a breathing apparatus in an attempt to revive the multimillionaire convicted pedophile. All right, so they have the photos... Uh, the, there's the one where he's on the gurney and they're, they're clearly giving him some sort of oxygen and he's got his hands up in a position that might indicate that there are handcuffs or something restraining him. Rigor mortis, again, all speculation, who knows, but there they are wheeling him in to the, uh, to the hospital. And then there's this photo with the ashen face and the other things has been described. So what does this actually show us and what does it not show us? Uh, first of all, there I, I've seen there's been people speculating that this is not the hospital. This isn't a hospital look. I mean, they didn't even stage it very well. First of all, this is FDNY and there's FDNY gurneys and this is the wrong doors and this isn't a hospital staging area and blah, 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 which I find particularly baffling because it really took about well, it takes about 15 seconds to determine that this is indeed New York Presbyterian Lower Manhattan Hospital. Let's do it together so that you know exactly how to do this, because it really does take about 15 seconds. You copy and paste that into the Google Maps. You take the little man and drag him here. If you're listening to the audio version of this podcast, we are on Google Maps now, and we're taking a virtual stroll around the hospital looking for that entrance. Oh, there's... Yeah, there's the emergency where the uh, ambulances are, and let's see if we can just get in front of there. No, we can't see it there. And let's go a little bit further. There we go, and there it is. And now let's zoom right on in, and we see those restricted access signs, the blue restricted access signs with the white writing, the, uh, the figures with the red cross through them on either side, exactly as in the photo uh, here. Yeah, exactly the same. And uh, there's clearly the green sign with the white writing just to the side of that. And that's the green sign with the white writing that we see. There's <laughs> This was taken in November 2017. Um, but there's, there's the orange FDNY gurneys lined up behind the ambulances. Uh, and there's the orange FDNY gurneys lined up where the ambulances are parking. Uh, in fact, in this v photo here, you can see the yellowish light on the orange FDNY gurneys. And on here, you can see the yellow light directly above the orange FDNY gurneys. This is the this is the entrance, just in case anyone had any doubt about that. This is the entrance where this photograph was taken, or an exact replica of this entrance was set up to stage this photo in the hours uh, between, in the hour and a half or so between the reporting of this. Actually, less than an hour, wasn't it? In between the reporting of this and uh, the, the first appearance of these photos. Again, I think, pretty obvious, this is the doors of this hospital. Um, so just in case there were any doubts about that. But um, that, there's a couple of things that we should be asking about these photos. One is William Farrington. How did this William Farrington, who took these photos, know to be there at 7.30 a.m., again, before anything had been reported, um, wheeling him in the doors? So he was there, staged, ready to go with his telephoto lens, presumably across the street, taking some photos of this scene. How did he know to be there? Well, uh, this is not an insoluble puzzle. Someone could ask him. In fact, I did try to do that. William Farrington's details are publicly available. Contact address and everything is publicly available. I won't put it on screen here because I'm sure that would be interpreted as doxing, but it is publicly available. It uh, takes, again, about 10 seconds to search. So you could find it yourself. I did put in uh, a contact request. Hey, uh, William Farrington, where did you get these photos? How did you know to be there? Was it, were you monitoring police scanners or, you know, what was it? Um, strangely, he hasn't gotten back to me yet, but I will start holding my breath awaiting that response. It's been about two days now, so we'll see. 
Um, but that, that is one question definitely that needs to be asked. How, how did William Farrington know to be there, to be taking pictures of this as it was happening? Um, the other question, of course, the one that's been raised a lot, is this Epstein? This doesn't look like Epstein. Um, and that is a very common argument, and there are pros and cons to that argument. But I tend to fall on the side of Corbett Report member Qno, who writes uh, regarding the supposed irregularities of the photos and the differences between this photo and other photos of Epstein. Qno in the CorbettReport.com um, uh, website comments writes, Yeah, I'm not convinced. Tube pressed against ear, older dead or dying after who knows what events, lying down, not standing up, different lighting, different camera lens and angle, might even be the other ear, I talking about the this, the comparisons that are people making uh, are making between the ear that is visible in this photo and the ear in other photos of Epstein taken at different times. Um, uh, not saying that it that isn't right, just not strong enough evidence for my liking. I agree with that. And and as Cuno goes on to say, even if it isn't him, that doesn't mean he isn't dead. President Kennedy was shot, but they still used a substitute body. Or that perhaps seeds of uncertainty aren't being deliberately sowed. One thing that's obvious is that the power shouldn't be would like us all arguing among ourselves, so we have to just keep calm and see evidence for what it is, not what we think it is. Uh, I think that's uh, all well taken on board, and I tend to agree. Uh, I know a lot of people tend to just inherently believe that they are forensic experts and know about cartilage and and what it is supposed to look like in different circumstances. And and uh, it's one of those things. It's done in Kruger in action. People do not know what they don't know, so they tend to overestimate their abilities in various fields, including, as I have had cause to demonstrate on the podcast here not just a couple of months ago, and we'll reiterate here, the incredible differences that people can see in shape and size of faces and, and uh, looks based on camera lens and lighting and focal length and zoom and all of those things can make someone look like a literally a different human being depending on the way photographs are taken, which if you were not a photographer, you would not even suspect was possible. Um, also, as Philip Sadi writes in the comment section of uh, CorbettReport.com, um, he writes, I think the reason for the ear shape and possibly the nose not matching up to previous pictures of Epstein is due to head trauma. If you got struck in the ear, it can cause the layers of the ear to separate and fill with fluid, causing immense swelling. Sometimes so severe it requires draining by a doctor. You see this often in combat sports like boxing, wrestling, MMA, etc., where the authority, the, the athletes regularly take impacts to the head and over time lead to permanent deformation, aka cauliflower ear, and he provides a link to an example of that, not for the squeamish, as he notes, but worth checking out. Again, uh, yes, if there was blunt force trauma to the head of some sort, that could definitely cause swelling and then drainage and then other things going on that, and like, again, unless you're a forensic pathologist, you probably are not able to evaluate uh, to any uh, reliable degree, and people overestimate their uh, sleuthing abilities. And I say this advisedly because about a decade ago, there was a deranged person going around calling everyone in the alternative media an actor, and everyone was an actor playing someone else. And I got accused of this, and many other people got accused of this. And of course, it's because they could tell because of ear analysis. Look at the ear. <laughs> that was that was a thing that was going around about a decade ago. So I know that people tend to overestimate their abilities to analyze these things. And I, I'm on the side of QNO Q and Philips D. I don't think that we can tell anything really substantially about this picture, whether this is Epstein or is not Epstein, or uh, what exactly is happening to this, or whether this person is dead or alive, or, or what have you. I mean, I just don't think it's solid evidence of anything. But again, I'm not an expert, so what, what do I know? What do the experts have to say about this? Well, let's turn to Christian Benavides, who reported on Twitter um, about the statement from the Office of Medical Examiner uh, on Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, this was from the day after 11th of August, where it says, Today, a medical examiner performed the autopsy of Jeffrey Epstein. The MEs, the medical examiner's determination, is pending further information at this time. At the request of those representing the decedent, and with the awareness of the federal prosecutor, I allowed a private pathologist, Dr. Michael Bodden, to observe the autopsy examination. This is routine practice. My office defers to the involved law enforcement agencies regarding other investigations around this death. Inquiries regarding the determination of the chief medical examiner should be directed towards my office. End quote. Hmm. 
Interesting. Dr. Michael Bodden was the private pathologist that the dissident, Jeffrey Epstein, and specifically his lawyers, wanted to have there to witness the autopsy examination. Dr. Michael Bodden. Dr. Michael Bodden. Where, where have I heard that name before? The first doctors or first scientific experts that saw the president after he was shot were the doctors at Parkland Hospital who operated on him. Those doctors actually saw the bullet wound in the president's throat and they described it as an entry wound while you have described it as an exit wound. Could you explain why that's the case? Yes, sir. The um, uh, physicians who treated the president at Portland Hospital did not turn the president over, so they did not know there was another bullet hole in the back. And there's a natural tendencies when a doctor sees one bullet hole and not a second bullet hole to just assume that it's an entrance wound. Doctor, how much money have you been paid for your involvement in the Simpson case to this point in time? It's uh, about 70 times 1,500, which would be about $100,000. Are any of these wounds inconsistent with the witness accounts that Michael Brown was shot while rushing the police officers? Uh, there, there, there could be consistent with his going forward or going backward, but they're for the front, and if he was shot uh, going forward, uh, uh, he would collapse uh, right away. Yes, that Dr. Michael Bodden, a.k.a. the autopsy pathologist specialist who has never seen a camera he doesn't like, as evidenced by his own TV show, let alone his many, many cases of involvement with celebrity deaths from, from the O.J. Simpson case to the JFK case to Eric Garner to all of these high-profile cases that have taken place in recent years, including... As Octium notes in the comment section of our open source investigation at CorbettReport.com, Bodden was also involved with the Nelson Rockefeller death in 1979, and he's going on tape number two from May Brussels World Watchers show, 2nd of May 1979. Uh, it, again, craziness, craziness. Um, I'm not even sure exactly what to make for it, other than that Bodden seems to be a pathologist for hire, shall we say, and who will apparently spin things any way that his clients want. Um, in what way would the clients of Epstein want this autopsy swung? I mean, I, I'm not even sure how that plays out exactly. Make of it what you will. There's some talk of it in that open source investigation, lots of mention of this online. So I'll let you delve into that if you're interested. There are some other weird connections with with uh, Nelson Rockefeller and Bodden and the people that they were hanging out with in the 70s and things. So I'm sure there's a whole deep rabbit hole there, but... At any rate, he was there to witness the autopsy, and there has been much made of the fact that the autopsy is being delayed for pending further information. What further information could they possibly need? Either he's staring strangled to death or not. I mean, there's not a whole lot of determination that needs to be made. Were there substances in his system? That kind of thing, I suppose, could be pending. But, well, I mean, let's turn to a source like nymag.com, what we know about Jeffrey Epstein's autopsy, which, of course, notes Barbara Sampson, the chief medical examiner of New York City, announced Sunday evening that she'd completed the autopsy, uh, declined, however, to make uh, any conclusions, saying in a statement that her determination is pending further information. The results of Epstein's autopsy are highly anticipated in the aftermath of his apparent su suicide early Saturday, which has launched many conspiracy theories and resulted in calls for investigation into the Manhattan prison where he was held. According to the New York Times, though, Samson is confident the cause of death is suicide by hanging. I mean, that's really the punchline here. Do, 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 does anyone expect that the autopsy is going to come back differently? I mean, it would be very interesting if it did, but color me shocked if it does come back by anything other than he died by hanging. I mean, I'm assuming that's where this is going, and she's already confident that that is the cause of death, and... That would, of course, put to rest those crazy conspiracy theories, right, New York Mag? So, there you go. I mean, that's that's where things are. Again, as I'm recording this on the 14th of August, again, I'm sure there will be some announcement on that in the coming days. Um, 
So let's turn to anything else that we can get. I mean, are there is there any evidence that this was Epstein that really did die, or that he didn't die, or what? Make of it what you will. Who knows, right? Well, uh, well, let's turn to a bizarre piece of this puzzle that comes, of course, from 4chan. Yes, 4chan.org, where on the poll message board, somebody posted at 8.16.36 a.m., 8.16 in the morning, i.e. about 40 minutes before it was announced to the public that Epstein was dead, someone started a thread, Jeffrey Epstein dead. And this person, this Anon, writes, don't ask me how I know, but Epstein died an hour ago from hanging, comma, cardiac arrest. Screen cap this. So that was the start of the thread. As you can expect, most people thought he was LARPing or, or joking and responded in that manner until the news broke about 40 minutes later, Epstein was dead. And uh, suddenly people were taking it very seriously. And that, that's been confirmed. I mean, there's nothing uh, hidden about this. Even New York Post has a post up. Why was Jeffrey Epstein's death on 4chan before it became public? Where they note, before the post broke the news of Jeffrey Epstein's death, it was posted to online message board 4chan, prompting the FDNY to probe whether one of its paramedics leaked the details. The user made a series of six posts beginning at 8.16 a.m. Saturday, around 40 minutes before news of the convicted pedophile's death broke. Uh, it says the messages include unconfirmed details about the aid first resp- responders rendered, PT transported to lower Manhattan ER and worked for 20 minutes and called said one message posted at 8.47 a.m. Saturday. Uh, Other 4chan users were quick to question the source of the information, and then without revealing the source, the leaker denied the post was bogus. Let's just say, I know, don't need a glowy coming to my crib. Talking about glow posting. The FDNY reviewed the alleged information and determined it did not come from the department, said FDNY Deputy Press Secretary Miles Miller in a statement. And then they're talking about um, paramedics and whether it was someone at the hospital and blah, blah, blah. So definitely someone did post 40 minutes before it happened, or sorry, 40 minutes before it was publicly announced, whatever that means, someone along the train, and for what purpose, and in what way, and, but somebody said Jeffrey Epstein was dead from cardiac arrest by hanging 40 minutes before anything was reported, and several days before the hanging detail came out, so make of that what you will. Later on in the thread is the infamous post that many people in the independent media are talking about, where someone with the ID SWAM8WIF wrote, Not saying anything after this, please do not try to dox me, but last night after 0415 count, they took him medical in a wheelchair, front cuffed, but not one triage nurse says they spoke to him. Next thing we know, a trip van shows up, question mark. We do not do releases on the weekends unless a judge orders it. Next thing we know, he's put in a single man cell and hangs himself, question mark. Here's the thing, the trip van did not sign in and we did not record the number plate and a guy in a green, uh, the plate number, and a guy in a green dress military outfit was in the back of the van according to the tower guy who led him through the gate. You guys, I am shaking right now, but I think they switched him out. I am shaking right now. And uh, much has been made of this and much has been rested on this. Well, here it is, an insider blowing the whistle. He was switched out, Uh, again, from... An anonymous 4chan post. Now, a lot has been placed, of emphasis has been placed on that, but not so much of a couple of comments later on in the thread, albeit by different IDs, but by some anon saying, you guys, I thought this was a joke thread. I made all this up. I'm sorry for the BS info. I thought OP was full of stuff, and I'm bored at work, so I typed this out for the Keck responses. He really is dead. Just saw on CNN. Mods, please delete my first post. I don't want to be part of a false narrative. I do not work for any NY prison or law enforcement. (coughs) And later on, another post. Nope, not a word of it is true. I'm 1,000 miles away from New York. Just having some Keck before I knew J.E. Jeffrey Epstein really was dead, and this thread would be archived and gone over with a fine-tooth crone by intelligence agencies. I'm effed, but at least I convinced a few normies of a fake conspiracy along the way. So, again, the response might be to say, well, how do we know this is the same Anon that posted the first information? It could just be someone else tagging on and LARPing and all of this. But that's exactly the point. Who knows about any of this? And there's no other confirmation of any kind about any of this stuff about the trip van and all of that. All we have is some post made anonymously by someone on 4chan that someone else or some some other person in that thread said was a joke and that they completely made up. What do you make of that? I make absolutely nothing of that. That's not evidence of anything. Or 
I mean, it could be true, certainly, but I don't put any weight or uh, uh, on that type of evidence until there's another way to triangulate that information. Anything else that would give any sort of uh, credence to that would be interesting, but I haven't seen it yet. So I don't put any stock whatsoever in that report at this point. So what else do we not know about what took place on August 10th? Um, well, we do know that there is no video of whatever happened in Ep Epstein's cell that morning. Um, this coming, again, the New York Post broke this on August 11th, where it said there's no surveillance video of the incident in which Jeffrey Epstein apparently hanged himself in a federal lockup in lower Manhattan, law enforcement officials told the Post on Sunday, although there are cameras in the 9th South Wing where the convicted pedophile was being held at the Metropolitan Correction Center, they are trained on the areas outside the cells and not inside, according to sources familiar with the setup there. So, that does leave open the possibility. Well, then, at the very least, then there is, question mark, or should be, a recording of his cell door in the hours and days preceding. So we would be able to see anyone who came in or went out or whatever happened at the door, at any rate, um, preceding whatever happened on August 10th. And there you go. If they switched him out, I mean, there would be video evidence of him being switched out. Although one would assume if this was some sort of big deep state military intel op to switch out a convict, they'd think about switching out the tape or what have you. But anyway, whatever it is, there's there's some sort of video or camera trained on the door, but nothing of the inside of the cell. So we'll never have a video of whatever of him hanging himself or anything else. Um... This, of course, raises the questions about what was or was not taking place in terms of the, uh, well, I mean, wasn't he being watched, visually watched, not on camera, but wasn't there, weren't there guards coming well? Uh, again, New York Post, Jeffrey Epstein was taken off suicide watch at his lawyer's request, as we noted at the top of this episode. Millionaire pedophile Jeffrey Epstein, who apparently killed himself while in federal custody in Manhattan, was taken off suicide watch in late July at the request of his attorney's according to a report. And this is sourcing from the Wall Street Journal, sources familiar with the matter. Again, whatever that means, take all this for what it's worth, but sources familiar with the matter are saying that his lawyers requested that he be taken off suicide watch, and thus he was not on suicide watch. He was not being constantly monitored. He did not. He was presumably not in the straight jacket type uh, outfit that the, uh, the other former uh, MCC inmate was talking about in that article we read earlier, all the other usual precautions you would see on a suicide watch. So in the days after this, everyone was saying, well, on suicide watch, he wouldn't do this. He couldn't do that. He, this, this would happen. That would happen. Well, none of that apparently applies because apparently he was secretly taken off suicide watch when nobody was looking. All right, fair enough. So it was at his lawyer's request, but it doesn't quite work that way. I mean, actually, that's not how this works. Uh, we can source this. Adam Klansfeld at Klansfeld Reports on Twitter was talking about this uh, soon after the uh, the events. A couple more questions in the Naming Names Department. BOP Bureau of Prisons guidelines require the program coordinator to write a report on any decision to remove an inmate from Suicide Watch. Who is that coordinator? Very good question and one that does have an answer. I haven't seen it yet and uh, I hope someone will dig it up and we can get more to the bottom of this. But if you go to that Bureau of Prisons policy uh, page, I will put the link in the show notes along with everything I'm talking about. It will be a voluminous show notes today, friends. Um, but uh, you can go to 13, page 13 of that report where they're talking about in, inmate observers and the, the suicide watch. And uh, in subsection D, it says watch termination and post watch report. Based upon clinical findings, the program coordinator or designee will, one, remove the inmate from suicide watch when the inmate is no longer at imminent risk for suicide, or two, arrange for the inmate's transfer to a medical referral center or contract healthcare facility. Once an inmate has been placed on watch, the watch may not be terminated under any circumstance, bold emphasis in original, without the program coordinator or designee performing a face-to-face -face evaluation, only the program coordinator will have the authority to remove an inmate from suicide watch. Generally, the post-watch report should be completed in PDS prior to terminating the watch or as soon as possible following watch termination to ensure appropriate continuity of care. Copies of the report will be forwarded to the central file, medical record, psychology file, and the warden. There should be a clear description of the resolution of the crisis and guidelines for follow-up care. So all of this 
according to the letter of the book and the law and the policy and what has to happen, there is a post-watch report that was signed off on by the, uh, the, the, the coordinator of this program that details all of this and when it happened and how it happened and what the, the face-to-face evaluation and what their, uh, the guidelines for follow-up care, the special observation status that he was placed on. All of that is in a report somewhere. I'm sure it's being FOIA'd right now. If there are any ambitious people in the audience who want to FOIA it, please do so. At any rate, you know, I'm sure it'll end up missing. We, we lost that record somehow. But anyway, so that, that supposedly does exist somewhere. Um, this is not an insoluble mystery. It's just uh, another piece of the puzzle that we do not have yet. Uh, more details about the lack of watch of any kind, even the kind that was the special observation status kind, the check every 30 minutes that was supposed to be happening, has been widely reported. For example, the good old New York Times. Before jail suicide, Jeffrey Epstein was left alone and not closely monitored. The disclosures about apparent failures in Mr. Epstein's detention deepened the questions about his death. Oh, you don't say. Um, it was Friday night in a protective housing unit of the federal jail in Lower Manhattan, and Jeffrey Epstein, the financier accused of trafficking girls for sex, was alone in a cell only 11 days after he'd been taken off a suicide watch. Just that morning, thousands of documents from a civil suit had been released, providing lurid accounts accusing Ms. Mr. Epstein, Mr. Epstein, of sexually abusing scores of girls. Mr. Epstein was supposed to have been checked by the two guards in the protective housing unit every 30 minutes, but that procedure was not followed that night, a law enforcement official with knowledge of his detention said. In addition, because uh, he had tried to commit suicide three weeks earlier, he was supposed to have had another inmate in his cell, three officials said, but the jail had recently transferred his cellmate and allowed Mr. Epstein to be housed alone a decision that also violated the jail's procedures, the two officials said. So please note, as with so many other big, important crimes that take place, in fact, almost every other one that we can think of, of big, high-profile crimes that take place, there are procedures that are not followed. There are things that are supposed to be done by the letter of the law. They are supposed to do this. This is supposed to happen. There's supposed to be records of this. There's supposed to be that. All of them break down magically to coincide with that August 10th death by suicide hanging, quote unquote. Um, and there are the w- other ways of attacking this this issue. And of course, it's been widely reported about the overstaffing and the hospital staff, the, uh, the the MCC staff were just overworked and what have you. And there were people on his watch who were on their fifth overtime shift in a row. And the person who was supposedly watching him wasn't even an actual guard. And all of this stuff is coming out. Um, this can be triangulated and confirmed by reports that uh, occurred even a year ago, June 20th, 2018. So over one year ago, the chiefleader.com had a report on federal jail union short staffing at MCC hurts weary co- uh, County's productivity. And it's talking about the chronic short staffing at Federal Metropolitan's Correction Center in Lower Manhattan, of course, where Epstein was being held. And it was talking at that time, over a year ago, about the the incredible short staffing and how they're having to go out of their way to offer incentives to try to get people to transfer there because they're they're overworked and what have you. Uh, But that's kind of almost the the point of this. This is a place that is holding high-profile inmates, some of the highest-profile inmates in the land. You might argue that Epstein was the highest-profile inmate in the entire United States prison system at this point, and still, lapse after lapse, not even a real guard on duty, they weren't doing their mandated checks. I mean, all of this breaking down, they just transferred out his cellmate? Wait, cellmate? Yeah, did he... he had a cellmate? Who was his cellmate? And what was his role in all of this? So well, we can find out some more information about that from published reports, like Jeffrey Epstein feared cellmate, a muscle-bound ex-cop charged in murder who was moved before financier, financier's death, according to report. A hulking ex-cop facing the death penalty on federal murder and drug charges was reportedly Jeffrey Epstein's cellmate and me- at Manhattan's Metropolitan Correction Center. And an official says Epstein might have feared the former police officer who was questioned after the disgraced financier's apparent suicide attempt last month and who was transferred out of Epstein's cell shortly before the 66-year-old died early Saturday. Nicholas Tartaglioni, who had been a Briarcliff Manor cop in Westchester County, New York, was charged in 2016 with the deaths of four men stemming from an alleged cocaine drug conspiracy. Epstein was housed at the MCC federal lockup with the 51-year-old former cop after his July arrest for sex trafficking, Tartaglioni's attorney told 
Fox News on Monday. And there's more information about him, but perhaps the most intriguing bit actually comes from, uh, well, I mean, many places, but lowhud.com. Feds, ex-cop Nicholas Tartaglioni had phone while in custody in quadruple killing case. This coming out on July 23rd, 2019, where it says an illicit cell phone was confiscated from former Briarcliff cop Nicholas Tartaglioni while he was in federal custody awaiting trial in the killings of four men in Orange County, according to court records. Correction officers took the phone from Tartaglioni on July 3rd in his cell at the MCC in Lower Manhattan. Federal prosecutors said that Tartaglioni claimed his cellmate had tossed it to him as officers approached. So, okay, so again, another huge lapse in security at this high profile place where these high profile inmates are being kept um but this cell phone in the in this with the cellmate uh apparently happened <coughs> three day, three days before epstein was even arrested but it does go to show something about the uh the nature of security at this prison and in fact more more details of that and that uh, those types of stories come from the Mail Online, for example, that reported on the security lapses at the jail where Jeffrey Epstein killed himself, where they note how a guard took a bribe from a Turkish gold dealer and how a WikiLeaks leader managed to share new information from phones, plural, phones, smuggled into his cell. And it goes on to d- detail about Joshua Adam Schulten. He had, I think, four phones in there. So, again, huge lapses in security. You can go and read through about that. But Clearly, there are ways to get to inmates at the MCC if you are motivated to do so. Who would be motivated to do so would be the question. But at any rate, that's what we know. And uh, But another interesting detail about this, sort of contrary to that, posted to the New York Post, suicide supposedly nearly impossible at sec- ultra-secure Jeffrey Epstein lockup. Jeffrey Epstein's shocking death occurred at an ultra-secure federal lockup where suicide is supposedly next to impossible. Uh, And it goes on to say he'd been on suicide watch there, presumably without access to a belt or shoelaces and closely monitored by guards as a standard protocol, but was taken off the list. It says that he was removed as recently as Thursday, but others claimed it had been in place only for about a week. The suicide watch, that is. Um, Etc., etc. It says suicide at the jail, which serves mainly as a holding facility for about 765 men and women awaiting trial for federal crimes of all levels, is rare, and a review of published stories found only one such death in the past 21 years, the 1998 suicide of South Philadelphia drug kingpin Louis Tura, Louis Tura, who reportedly hanged himself. So, there you go. You have one case of suicide at this prison in 21 years, and the very next one is the highest, arguably the highest profile inmate in the entire U.S. federal prison system. The one that everyone, including yours truly, was talking about was likely to end up committing suicide in jail. Well... And there it is, right? So what do we really know about this? Again, like in so many other circumstances where it turns out, oh, the cameras all failed, or we just, uh, things, proper procedure wasn't followed, or or what have you. In so many different high-profile cases, including this one, procedures were not followed, precautions were not taken, warnings were not heeded. It's almost as if people were going out of their way to make it as... Uh, as likely as possible that something could happen out of the sight of whoever was supposed to be looking. And oh, by the way, let's take the people who are supposed to be looking out of the picture as well. So clearly there is, if you were trying to arrange something, whether that something is a swap out of Epstein for someone else or a murder or a suicide, if you were trying to leave space for any of those events to happen, you couldn't have done a better job than what happened over this past week or two at that MCC in Lower Manhattan. So that is essentially the state of what we know at this precise moment in time and what we don't know. I mean, there's so many question marks in this equation, including the fundamental question, was it Epstein? Did Epstein die? I mean, we, I don't have his body here. I can't show it to you. I don't know. Uh, it, it's certainly a possibility that he was swapped out or it was someone else or no one died. It was all staged. I don't know. I genuinely do not know. Uh, I also would point out that, generally speaking, in operations like this, I don't think they have any compunction whatsoever, the people involved in these types of operations, of killing someone who has information. I don't think this would be any different, except if you were going to be involved in an operation like this to kill someone who could testify and who obviously had information and records, and as is now coming out, even bragged to random other journalists that he was talking to and other people that he had 
uh, compromising information on politicians and things. He was blabbing his mouth in the last couple of years. If some of these reports that are coming out now are to be believed, well then, certainly there is ample reason for all sorts of people to want this person dead. But they would have to be extra careful that either there was no dead man switch or that you could cover up any sort of dead man switch. And interestingly, we see now there is an FBI raid on Pedophile Island, which was owned, of course, by Epstein and where he had his temple and all of that craziness going on. Now it's being raided. So after the death or whatever happened and after all of this. So uh, let's all hold our breath and wait for the FBI to present and and display to the world all the evidence that they collect there and dis- display it for the public to, to look at and evaluate. Oh, wait, I have a feeling. I just tend to have a feeling that the real evidence is being covered up there. And maybe that's part of this operation, whatever really went down there. If it was an, uh, an operation, I mean, it could be a suicide. That is a possibility. I, I don't see how it's physically possible, but it is at least something that's that's one of the possibilities here. The point being that there is so much about this that we don't know, and there may be little bits and pieces that t- trickle down from all of this that will definitively point us in one direction or another with regards to did he die, did he not die, how did he die, all of that information. But again, I'm not necessarily holding my breath for it. We are at the bottom level of the information ladder, and we're getting whatever's falling down on our heads from above. So there's lots of room for gatekeepers between us and the information itself, and one would expect those to be implemented. So this is the unsatisfying conclusion of this part of our exploration. What do we really know? The answer is not that much. I've just laid out what we know and what we don't know, but it leaves us not having any fundamental clue of what really, really took place in that cell on August 10th, 2019. But perhaps that isn't the point. Perhaps that is not the point of whatever has taken place in the last few days. And if that isn't the point, what is the point? Well, one thing that we can, I think, pretty definitively conclude right now is that whatever happened or didn't happen, the Jeffrey Epstein character in this whole story, which is a much bigger story that involves blackmail and intelligence operations and all of these connections, the Jeffrey Epstein character in that story has been ridden out. He has been retired. One way or another, we will never hear Jeffrey Epstein again. He will never pop up. Unless, of course, the, the people speculating, oh, he's been staged, they, the, deep, the good guys in the deep state helped stage his death so he could go to some place to, to testify against everyone. Yeah, holding my breath for that. But assuming that's not the case, I'm pretty sure Jeffrey Epstein has been ridden out of this story. His character has been retired in a much similar manner to the Osama bin Laden character being ridden out in May 2011. According to you and another number of analysts, bin Laden has been dead for quite some time already. If that were true, why would the U.S. wait till now to announce his death? Well, first, let me uh, correct you. I'm not in uh, New York. I'm actually in Japan. But um, but uh, it's not my contention that that Osama bin Laden definitively has been dead for some time, but that he has his death has been announced a number of times at any rate. And uh, and I don't see why we should take this uh, this pronouncement any more seriously than any of the previous pronouncements, especially considering the complete and utter lack of evidence that has so far been produced to show that Osama bin Laden or anyone resembling that description was actually killed yesterday. But I think it's important to understand the announcement that occurred yesterday, not through the lens of the announcement of the death of some terrorist mastermind so much as the uh, retirement party for a known CIA asset along the lines of uh, Lee Harvey Oswald back in November 1963. All right, obviously those were my comments in the hours after it was being reported that Osama bin Laden had been killed and and his body thrown in the ocean before anyone could see it. (laughs) That was my initial response to that and that's essentially my initial response to this Epstein case. At any rate, this intelligence operative of one sort or another has been ridden out of the picture. He has been retired one way or another, whenever and however that has happened and whether or not he's been given a secret life on a hidden hidden island somewhere, whatever it is, I'm sure we'll never see him again. So the point is, the real point of this investigation is, okay, so what? So what now? What, What actually, what does this mean? In terms of the specific court ongoing criminal charges and all of that, 
and then in the bigger picture of the overall Epstein investigation. Well, let's let's tackle these questions. The first one, uh, there are some interesting and conflicting things that are being thrown around right now. One, for example, at Klasfeld Reports on Twitter, reporting first reaction, there should be hearings to how this was allowed to happen to a key witness to in an investigation involving global sex trafficking conspiracy. Second reaction, a former federal re- prosecutor informs me about this second order effect in terms of legal procedure. Background, an important note after Epstein's death, no one else will have standing to challenge the search warrant on his house. Everything will be admissible against any other defendant without possibility of a motion to suppress. So as we all know, the the police did raid Epstein's house and materials were seized. And we have lists of things that were seized, like CDs with pictures of nude females and uh, various labels and things that have been reported. All of that would have been challengeable by Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, Did they have the proper search warrant? Did they have the authorization to, to take these materials? That can't be challenged by anyone else. So if there's anyone else who is implicated in those materials, that material supposedly now is fair game for use in prosecution of other people. So again, assuming that the prosecutors are inclined to actually prosecute people for what's going on here, this is apparently one legal thing on the side of the good guys, should the good guys be interested in that. Um, Another interesting story that was reported, Jeffrey Epstein's final days and the legal cases that won't die with him Uh, It says, in the final days of Jeffrey Epstein's life, the high-flying financier who had once counted royalty and presidents among his friends was largely flying under the radar, communicating little from his eight-foot square cell in a New York federal lockup. Epstein was grounded following his July arrest on sex trafficking charges that had dodged him for decades, charges that now threatened to keep him locked up for 45 years which for the 66-year-old is the equivalent of a life sentence. He mostly kept to himself, federal source, blah, blah, blah. He was polite, didn't say much. And then, da-da-da, suicide, death, blah, blah, blah. With regard to the criminal case, our law presumes him innocent, said David Katz, a former assistant U.S. attorney in Los Angeles. We will not have Epstein's side of the story. While that may not have exonerated him, it might exculpate some alleged accomplices. The U.S. Manhattan and, uh, the U.S. Attorney in Manhattan has declared that others who may have conspired with Epstein will continue to be closely investigated. But according to Katz, who did not work on the Epstein case, anyone charged will likely claim that Epstein alive would have cleared him or her, and they would have de- they were deprived of Epstein testifying for and providing material on their behalf because of government negligence. All right, so that's a negative to this investigation, but. Uh, Melissa L. Jampel, a former sex crimes assistant at the Manhattan District Attorney Office, underscored that a brighter light will now likely shine on the other names in the Epstein Circle and any possible criminal proceedings against them. There is a strong possibility that criminal charges could be brought against others involved in the allegations involving Epstein and who were potentially his co-conspirators, those who enabled his actions, said Jampel. Epstein's death may also make survivors more likely to come forward and contact local law enforcement authorities because now they don't fear Epstein and his reach because he's dead. So... There are interesting legal implications to this. It all, of course, depends on how vigorously and how honestly the accomplices and other people implicated uh, in these crimes are pursued. But don't worry, because as The Hill.com reports, Barr criticizes prison series irregularities after Epstein's death. Attorney General William Barr said Monday that Justice Department officials will thoroughly investigate, quote, serious irregularities, end, end quote, at the Metropolitan Correctional Center, where accused sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein was found dead of apparent suicide over the weekend. Barr also warned that any of Epstein's alleged co-conspirators should not rest easy noting that federal prosecutors will continue to aggressively pursue the case to ensure anyone who worked alongside Epstein will be held accountable. All right. Uh, And he goes on to say, let me assure you, this case will continue on against anyone who was complicit with Epstein, Barr said. Any co-conspirator should not rest easy. The victims deserve justice and they will get it. Bold words. And of course, we can take U.S. Attorney General William Barr at his word, right? I mean, he is the Attorney General, after all, and we all know how non-corrupt they tend to be. Um, Well, I mean, is this the same William Barr who is the son of the Donald Barr who may or may not have been the one personally responsible for hiring Epstein as uh, as an instructor at the Dalton School, despite the fact that he was a a college dropout? 
Um, but he was hired to teach at this swank private school where apparently he first made his connections, they got him onto Wall Street, they got him headed towards billionaire status, whatever, however that story goes. Good question, and one that is still something of a question. It was originally unproblematic, unproblematically reported that Donald Barr had hired Epstein at the Dalton School. Then there was some reporter who said, no, 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 Dal uh, Barr left shortly before Epstein was hired, so he, he wasn't hired, there's no connection there. But then there's counter-reporting to that reporting, saying, no, the person who followed Barr as head of the Dalton School said that he hadn't interviewed Epstein, so it must have been Barr, blah, blah, blah. I, there's back and forth. And I believe that was touched on specifically in that open source investigation thread at corporatereport.com. I've read this somewhere recently. I've read all about this in the past few weeks, so forgive me if I'm confusing that, but there's been back and forth. But anyway, very likely that this is the son of the man who hired Epstein. So can we take it at face value that Barr and the Attorney General's office, let alone the FBI, let alone all of these other no institutions that we know are corrupt, are going to follow through on these cases in the way they should? Maybe not. But that's the legal side of things, and... Again, we can hold our breath and wait for the legal court proceedings against all of Epstein's co-conspirators to take place and for all of this to be revealed. But don't hold your breath indefinitely for that. Um, so what are the bigger, bigger picture effects of this retirement party for Jeffrey Epstein? Well, uh, one that I have noticed definitely in the reporting of this over the past several days, and I'm sure you have noticed too, is... The coming, the, the, the keeps coming up this this term to describe people who question this apparent suicide by apparent hanging. How could you have any questions about this? But in case you do, there is a two-word epithet for you that has been bandied about ad nauseum in the mainstream media over the past few days. Just a few examples: The Hill.com, Trump defends promoting conspiracy theory about Epstein's death. It was a retweet. Or uh, thenation.com, Epstein's death demands investigation, not conspiracy theories. Yes, because people who are investigating a suspicious event certainly should never ha po posit any theory or even th contemplate a theory. They should never even hold a theory in their mind, right? Because that might actually lead them to look for certain pieces of information, <laughs> right? Because, of course, by definition, every, every investigator, every detective, every person involved in a case like this is a conspiracy theorist. They're theorizing all the time. Oh, well, what if this person did this? Then we should look for that. That's what detectives do. That is what an investigation is. But don't worry, the nation.com is here to set the record straight. The Epstein's death demands investigation, not conspiracy theories. Uh, BBC, of course, was right there on the scene within days. Jeffrey Epstein, how can conspiracy theories spread after financier's death. In fact, again, just type conspiracy theory Epstein into the Google News search and you'll find no end to mainstream coverage of this in the last several days. Unfortunately, that has been taken over in the last 36, 48 hours by tw Trump and his retweet of conspiracy theories, which is now what everything is about. But before that point, there were a lot of things. I'm sure I saw editorials headline something like, uh, why conspiracy theories about Epstein are wrong or whatever. I mean, there's there's no end to that type of commentary in the mainstream media as a result of this, which, of course, does shine a light on the fact that now there are many, 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 many people asking questions about this and becoming conspiracy theorists, the dreaded conspiracy theorists that we know, as the FBI has recently informed us, are being treated as potential domestic terrorists who may cause harm and deserve to be scrubbed from the internet, interestingly enough. Interestingly, there have been some in, you know, counter-narrative takes, shall we say, even within the mainstream press. Surprising source, NewYorkTimes.com op-ed by Ross Douthat? Douthat? I don't know how to pronounce that name. Douthat? <laughs> Uh, an interesting op-ed entitled Jeffrey Epstein and When to Take Conspiracies Seriously. It says sometimes conspiracy theories point towards something worth investigating. A few point toward the truth. And although obviously, you uh, please do read through this op-ed. I won't read it for you here, but 
uh, please do read through it. I think you will find that obviously it's not exactly CorbettReport.com crowd type stuff and doesn't go far enough and does contain it, you know, some pejoratives, but it goes surprisingly far towards saying, well, there was this conspiracy theory, but actually there is some truth to that. And well, there's this crazy conspiracy theory, but actually it's worth looking into this. Uh, it goes on to talk about those crazy conspiracy anti-vaxxers and things, but you'd have to be kind of crazy to just believe corporations are there for your best interest. I mean, there is there is some interesting counterpoints being put out there in the mainstream narrative. So let the speculation commence about what that means, what all of this rumina rumination and speculation and this convergence towards the term conspiracy theory at this particular moment in time means. What does this mean in the bigger picture? And... Uh, there has already been speculation of that in the open source investigation at CorbettReport.com about why now and what does this mean and conspiracy theorizing. Uh, and I'm sure there will be plenty more speculation. At a certain point, this speculation about why now and what does this term mean and what are they trying to set us up into becomes the snake eating its own tail to essentially get us into paralysis. So wait... Uh, okay, I got. Uh, they're playing 5D chess, so I have to play 6D chess. And they want people conspiracy theorizing so that they can group them as domestic terrorists. So they're trying to create situations to create people becoming conspiracy theorists. So we have to not conspiracy theorize so that we don't fall into... And it becomes this multidimensional chess maneuver or something. No, at the end of the day, either you are going to investigate something that you find interesting or you are not. And you should have some sort of basis for doing that or not doing that or you're, you know, whatever it is, but it shouldn't be because you think that the press is trying to get you to move in a certain direction or what have you. At the end of the day, it has to come down to what you think is important. So, of course, as did come up in that CorbettReport.com open source investigation thread, there were people questioning the re reason for doing this at all. And that could be said about really any story. I mean, why, why are we doing this? Well, again, there is no definitive answer that can be made to that. Either this is something that you think is important, that needs to be investigated, or it isn't. And I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to any of that. But that is where this leaves us, in a very uh, flux situation. As I say, I mean, the story itself is breaking and developing with new developments every few hours. Again, what all of this information may be outdated by the time you're listening to this, even if you're listening to it right away, let alone days or weeks or months down the road. So let's switch the open source investigation over to the comment section for this episode 361 of the Corbett Report podcast at CorbettReport.com. Specifically, the short link for this episode will be CorbettReport.com slash EpsteinDeath all one word, just type that in corbettreport.com slash Epstein death. You will get the, the podcast, the video versions of this, all the downloads. You'll get the show notes, which as I say, will be voluminous. And I will put in the extra effort to time index the show notes as I, as I used to do for the podcast, uh, because there's so many references here to so many different things that it'll get confusing what the link is referring to what. So I'll try to time index everything so that any particular thing that I'm talking about, go to the time index. It should be in there in the show notes, so you can go to that link and read the documents for yourself or look at the video. There's so much to talk about, and I've only scratched the surface of it. Um, and as I say, this is a developing story, so I hope the Corporate Report community will continue to put any particularly important developments towards what we know, what we don't know, what we know that we don't know, things like that, in that comment thread at CorbettReport.com. And let me once again just thank everyone for participating in that open source investigation over the past few days and in the site generally. Again, I literally could not do this without the support of the Corporate Report members, both monetarily, of course, as little as $1 a month truly does make this website possible, but secondarily and not not secondarily in terms of importance, your participation in threads like this, in compiling and analyzing data, I cannot possibly do that much work. Um, so hundreds of hands, thousands of hands, let's make it millions of hands, make light work. And uh, it's, it's only that conversation which I think can raise this above the efforts of one particular individual. So thank you to the Corporate Report community for participating in this. Uh, obviously, there's so much more to say about the Epstein story, the bigger Epstein story and the connections and what went where, but I wanted to put this on the record at this point, what we know, where the case stands, so that it is there and documented and you have plenty of links to explore on this case. So we're going to leave this particular exploration here for today. I will have more to say to you in the near future. I hope you will be there to enjoy it at CorbettReport.com. That is the place to go for all of this material. And we're going to leave it there for today. 
I am James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. I am looking forward to talking to you again in the very near future.